will, um, I guess, uh, settle in and start our meditation. Oh. Allowing your mind and allowing your body Just settle down. All the excitement of getting yourself into your room and into your Zoom room. Leaving all that aside, you're here now. Noticing yourself, noticing yourself sitting in this room, what does it feel? What does the room feel? What does it what does the space feel? You're here and nowhere else. Noticing your body. Again, you are here and nowhere else. Allowing yourself to connect with yourself. Leaving the world behind. And becoming aware of your own inner world. Aware of your physical body. And getting to know what's going on.
the tension anywhere. Is there relaxation? Usually we notice the tension. There are parts that are also relaxed. Allowing yourself to just notice. Be with whatever there is. So hopefully you have all done some meditation before. I won't go into great in length of instructions. But with this basic awareness of your body, you get to know yourself. Meditation is about getting to know yourself. So I will leave you to continue. Can I go on to your usual object of meditation? Breathe the breath of. For me, it's just being with the body. But remembering we're just here to get to know. Curious. Not trying to change anything, manage anything. Just to understand.
mind drifts away, bringing it back. Remembering the purpose of our being here. That it wanders away, but if it keeps going to certain places, it's good to know why. Why does it keep going there? Not just enjoy being with something simple. Nowhere to go, nothing to do.
simplicity of just one object. Bringing your mind back and it wanders away. Just being at ease with whatever you are right now. Being at ease with whatever you feel. Enjoying the fact that you don't have to create anything, improve anything, not even improve yourself. All we are trying to do is to get to know ourselves.
and be so happy with just the way we are with ourselves. Bringing your mind slowly back to this room, this space you're in. Becoming aware and sitting on this chair. And as we come to the end of the meditation, taking note of what went on in the last half an hour. Where was your mind? What did it most go towards? And when was it quiet? Noticing how you feel at the beginning and at the end. Dedicating any peace that we feel, any ease that we feel. May that benefit those around us. And somehow, those who we don't know, those who we don't see, we're all connected. May our goodness, may our peace be of benefit to others. May it spread. And may all beings live in a world at peace. When you're ready, you slowly open your eyes.
Everyone stretching and getting back into the into the normal way of being. Okay. So I'm on a meditation retreat. I might I might go a little bit too 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 deep, but uh, this is something I've been reflecting on um, uh, while practicing and Hopefully it's something that will benefit you as well. As you know, the Buddhist teaching is actually quite profound. It's not only about your own just a little world and and finding a little bit of peace and, and uh, comfort in this crazy world. But it's far more profound than that. It's about ultimately freeing our minds entirely, freeing it entirely from everything that we hold on to that keeps us endlessly going on and on in sansara. This might be quite a, like I said, I've been on retreat, but uh, anyway, we go on and on, life after life, and there's something that binds us, that makes us keep going, that um, is all right, but ultimately, sometimes life is good, sometimes life is bad. As we all know, the Buddha's first teaching was on suffering. There's always something that goes wrong. And so the, the, the start of the sutta was, well, start of this um, thought process was um, why do we go on like this, you know? that makes me come back life after life. And I, I remember something venerable, well, actually, one of our sutta studies while, while we were in the UK was um, what's, uh, uh, it's uh, the questions of Saka, the Saka Panya Sutta. And, oh dear, this is a, very unfortunate. Saka is the king of the, the king of kings, the king of the, the lord of lords, you could say, the lord of the devas. And he comes to visit the Buddha and he asks the Buddha um, a question that I ask myself as well, you know, why is it that despite all of us want waking up in the morning and wanting to be happy, why is it that we end up having thoughts of jealousy, of hate, of um, ill will. Why is it, despite us wanting to be having a good mind and, and wanting to be, be, be kind, why do we still end up having thoughts that 
of ill will and jealousy and hate and malice and all these negative things, why do we keep having them? So Saka asks the Buddha this question. And it's a good question because um, it seems to be, it has been the problem for countless aeons. So um, I pull up the sutta, which disappeared on me again. Deganikaya. Here we go. Okay. Here you go. And so here we go. This is how it says. So, dear sir, what fetters bind the gods, humans, demons, dragons, and devas, and any of these other diverse creatures, so that though they wish to be free from enmity, violence, hostility, and hate, they still have enmity, violence, hostility, and hate. Such was Saka's question to the Buddha. And the Buddha answered him. So this is what the Buddha says. Lord of gods, Saka, the fetters of jealousy and stinginess bind the gods, humans, demons, dragons, and devas, and any other diverse creatures, so that Though they wish to be free from enmity and violence, hostility and hate, they still have enmity, violence, hostility and hate. So the fetters of jealousy and stinginess bind the gods. Such was the Buddha's answer to Saka. Delighted, Saka approved and agreed with the Buddha said and what the Buddha said, saying, that's so true, blessed one. That's so true, holy one. Hearing the Buddha's answer, I've gone beyond doubt and got rid of indecision. So the, 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 the Buddha says, the fetters of jealousy and stinginess bind us. And then, having approved and agreed with what the Buddha said, Saka asks another question. But dear sir, what is the source, the origin, the birthplace and inception of jealousy and stinginess? When what exists is there jealousy and stinginess? When what doesn't exist is there no jealousy and stinginess? This is a good question. What is it that makes us feel these feel this way? And this is where the Buddha says, the liked and the disliked, O Saka, are the source of jealousy and stinginess. When the liked and the disliked exist, there is jealousy and stinginess. When the liked and the disliked don't exist, there is no jealousy and stinginess. So this is what makes us want to, you know, get upset with people. And despite not wanting to feel upset, we still do because we like certain things and we don't like certain things. But dear sir, what is the source of what is liked? and disliked. 
why do we like certain things? Why don't we like certain things? Why do we see certain people and go like, oh, they're great and see certain people and go, well, I don't think I want to get to know that person. I'm going to stay away from them. We think we're actually smart. We think we're actually, you know, really clever at working out what's good and what's bad. But it's this disliking and disliking the Buddha says it's the problem. We thought we were being really clever, but he says, well, the problem is because you think you are being clever, because you think you you these are the things that you should go for, these are the things that you shouldn't go for. That is the reason why you are feeling this anger, jealousy, whatever it is. But, says Saka, what is a source of light and dislike? And the Buddha says, desire is the source of what is light and dislike. Desire is the source of what is liked and disliked. Mm. I thought it was good to look after myself. I thought it was good to know what, what, um, what is beneficial for me and what is not beneficial for me. Mm. So desire is the source of what is liked and disliked. But what is the source of desire? And the Buddha says, thought is the source of desire. Thought is the source of desire. Thought, 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 what we think. Hmm, if I do this, this will be beneficial. If I don't do this, this will... This won't work out. Um, I remember the last time I, I talked to this person, they got really upset when I said such and such and such a thing. So thought is the source of like and dislike. Sorry, yes. But what is the source of thought? Concepts and identity that emerge from proliferation and perception are the source of thoughts. Wow. Concepts and identity that emerge from the proliferation of perception are the source of thoughts. So basically that's a, a big word that says, that says we think a lot, <laughs> and come up with all these solutions just so that we have a concept of identity, just so that we have a sense of self, a sense of I that can exist and be comfortable and safe. All those thoughts that go around that, that is what keeps us thinking and that's what keeps us desiring and that's what keeps us getting upset and liking and disliking. So this is a terribly succinct sutta um, that is uh, uh, the source of all our problems, really. We like, to, we like to come up with all these theories of how I can do this, I can do that, all this around creating a, a sense of self that can be safe and and comfortable and okay. So, but how, says the um, Saka, but how does a mendicant fittingly practice for the cessation of concepts and identity that emerge from the proliferation of perception? Oh, oh my God, what a sentence. So basically, how the heck do we go beyond this? How do we, the heck do we go beyond these thoughts that we constantly have that about me, 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 me? 
So this is what um, the sutta is all about. Uh, and uh, so, um, okay, I hope I don't lose this page, but anyway, I might. So that, that, is, that was why I started talking. I thought I'd talk about the sutta, about liking and disliking, why it is important liking and disliking and all these thoughts about ourselves is what keeps us going on and on and on every day, day after day, week after week, lifetime after life, lifetime. I like this, I don't like that, this should be this way, this shouldn't be that way. I remember one of my uh, Venerable Niroda, who's here with me, uh, she's been a nun for, I think, I don't know, at least, probably, she was one of the first nuns that ordained with Ajahn Brahm. Anyway, one of her favorite lines was a Zen quote that says, the path is, the path is easy for one who has no preferences. The path is easy for one who has no preferences. So I remember this many of you and I saw, I remembered, oh, the path is easy for one who has no preferences. But how the heck do I have no preferences? So, um, and and I also remember one of Ajahn Chah's um, favorite, well, I remember what I've heard, you know, one of Ajahn Chah's quotes was, uh, you haven't begun practicing until you've given up liking and disliking. You haven't started practicing until you give up liking and disliking. So, why is it important? So, why is it so important to have liking and disliking? Not have liking and disliking. Isn't it nice, you know, when you meet someone who is like that have you met someone who has no preferences isn't it like i i i often i often think of well ajahn brahm really when you sit with him you don't feel judged it's a blessing isn't it to be with someone who doesn't judge who doesn't have any expectation of how you should behave or, or what you should be, to be with someone who has, whose happiness does not depend upon how you behave. Isn't it a blessing to be with someone like that? And so when we don't have a sense of judgment, a sense of, liking and disliking we're actually a blessing to others because we know what it feels like to not be judged we know what it feels like to be with someone who just has no agenda accepts you for who you are so this business of liking and disliking is really it's a it, it causes us suffering and it causes other people suffering and if we can somehow um, see through that, then uh, then um, we are not only helping ourselves, but we are of we are a blessing to the world. We are a blessing to all those who we encounter. So. How do we get about this business of not liking and disliking? Ah. So this is what I've been thinking of the last few weeks. Like I said, I've been on retreat. How do we get about this business of not liking and disliking? So um, I encourage you to also, you know, contemplate, but, um, so let me tell you about some of the things that I came up with. 
Um, right. Well, first of all, you have to start off with having some mindfulness, isn't it? You've got to start off with most of the time we're not even we don't even realize we've we've made a decision. We actually, like I said, we think we're smart. We think, ah, oh, that first that thing's good for me. That thing's not good for me. You know, I've I've got to um, uh, I've got to. These people are good. Those people are no good. You know, instantly we've clicked on something. We've we've um, said something. We've we've um, um, bought something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't buy stuff. But anyway, most of the time, we're not even aware of what our likes and dislikes are. Most of the time, we don't even um, we don't even realize that we've gone down the road of liking and disliking. So start off, we start off by just starting to bring some awareness, bring, bringing awareness to what is going on in your mind. And notice the things that trigger you, you know, from the grossest to the most subtle. What are the things that trigger you? So um, ask yourself. So for me, the thing, one of the things that trigger me the most is, of course, other people. <laughs> Isn't it? what we expect other people to say and what other people to do, that's one of our triggers. So we notice, what is it that makes us um, uh, like certain things that people say, don't like certain things that people say? Why do we get upset when, when uh, when people behave in a certain way and when they don't. So um, notice the things that trigger you. Notice the things that that uh, that make you like and dislike certain things. Why is it? Why is it that? Why is it you're thinking in this particular way? Why are you? Um, what is? What is your thought pattern? So um, another thing to uh, to to be mindful of is uh, not only other people but yourself. So often we're triggered by our own body of comfort and discomfort. You know when um, the body is is uh, there. It's it's uh, you're cold for me. I've been in Santi, which, which is, which is, people don't believe in central heating in Australia. It's quite cold, and uh, and uh, the cooties mostly have no electricity. I've picked one that has electricity, the only one that has electricity, but mostly the cooties have no electricity. So whenever I'm cold, I'm like, oh God, I've got to turn the heater on. But why is it? What is it in our body that that makes us? Um, um upset when 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 it's not a certain way and it is a certain way so becoming aware of the sensations in our body and the the discomforts that we immediately react to we immediately turn on the heater or or um uh i don't know change posture, go and get something to eat, noticing that our body is such a trigger for liking and disliking. So getting to know our bodies and also getting to know how we react, how we react to other people, how we react to um, what other people say, how we relate to other people. These are some of the big triggers for liking and disliking. So being mindful and getting to know ourselves is a lot of what meditation and Buddhism is. Getting to know um, 
you know, how we tick, we kind of run on autopilot, but getting to know how we tick, this is what mindfulness is. This is what um, the four satipatthanas are about, about getting to know our bodies, our reactions, our feelings, so that we are not just running on autopilot. So the first thing that we do when we, we're trying to understand ourselves is just to get to know our bodies and get to know our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings, our triggers. So there are gross ones, the obvious ones, and there are also the subtle ones. Even subtle ones, like for me, it's like, a, I like good Dhamma teachings. I think it's good for me. <laughs> good Dhamma teachings. And when the Dhamma talk isn't good, I just turn it off and change to something else. So in this world of the internet, liking and disliking is like, you know, magnified. We are completely slaves to our liking and disliking. Yeah, so getting to know ourselves and getting to know the, the gross things and the subtle things. Where do our minds pull towards and where does it push away from? Catching it before it runs down the familiar old road. So, so that is the start of uh, knowing our liking and disliking. But then some likes are good for us, isn't it? Some things are actually good for us. If I did get cold and I got a, and I ended up with a, 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 a with um, a bit of a flu last week from actually from actually getting cold so some things aren't good for us it is true that um, being cold is no good and it is true that listening to bad dhamma talks is actually a waste of time so how do we decide how do we decide what is actually um good things to like and and um things that actually are good not to like this is a difficult is a question, isn't it? This is what the Buddha calls wholesome and unwholesome states. Wholesome and unwholesome states. So now we figured that we go beyond, go behind liking and disliking. But how do we decide what are the likes that are good for us and what are the likes that are not good for us? So, most of us, we go for instant gratification, don't we? We go for the thing that, you know, straight away we do it and it gives us some pleasure. We go to the fridge and get something to eat. You feel better and ah, you know. But then after a few years, you've decided, realized you've started to put on weight. <sighs> Or um, for me, um, uh, for me, when I feel a little bit tired, I think, oh well, I've got to, I've got to rest and relax my body. So I'm just going to lie down on my bed for a little while, and then after a while, I've noticed I've been asleep for an hour or two, and after a few years, I've realized I've become quite attached to my pillow. So um, certain things in the beginning, they give you some satisfaction, but in the long run, you work, you, 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 you found out that um, actually I've developed quite a, quite a bad habit. So noticing that instant gratification isn't necessarily uh, uh, the 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 way to to um, peace and happiness. 
Kema Chodron talks about uh, being at ease with discomfort. She calls it being at ease with groundlessness. So when things come up that we instantly want to pick up, we like it, we take it up, or we push it away, noticing what is going on and just being with that sense of discomfort, not instantly gratifying ourselves, being with uncertainty, can we do that? Being with, being ungrounded. Being with not knowing. So, the difficulty that all of us get into when we we learn all this Dhamma is that it becomes it becomes a ideology. Now we know now we know that we shouldn't like and dislike. So every time like and dislike comes, I'm going to I'm going to not go down that road. I'm going to not get upset with that person or I'm, I, it becomes a, a heady thing you know it becomes like a a, a a plan that we have and so then we we we, we become quite uh, fixated isn't it I won't like and dislike <laughs> I hear FIFA laughing this is something that I've gotten into I know very well it's called the uh, one uh, Ajahn Suchitta calls the inner tyrant that sort of has decided on the Dhamma and it decides, okay, now I know what is good for me and now I'm going to do it this way every time liking and disliking comes. I'm not going to head down that way. But that doesn't work either. That doesn't work either. So we know the Dhamma and now we've got a, we've got a strategy, but then that starts to hurt as well. So uh, the mind has so many twists and turns. We have to keep catching it at every one of these, these uh, tri trips that it goes on. And one of it is, is having the idea of the Dhamma and having a, uh, uh, having a strategy that we will follow. But... Uh, that doesn't work either. So then we again, we investigate and again, we look what is going on. You know, what has the mind um, uh, got stuck on this time? And often we start, it's because we've started coming from the head. We started coming from the head and not from the heart. So all of these practices, it has to be done with a soft heart, with the heart that is compassionate, which is forgiving, which allows yourself to make mistakes and to be open. So we learn that as we investigate and as we look into ourselves, we do so not with an ideology, but with a sense of knowing that we're just human beings, that we don't really know the answer, that we're willing to be open and to make mistakes. And we come from that soft place of not knowing the answer. 
and allow ourselves to be vulnerable, to be uncertain. And so you get to know the mind, the mind that just knows, that feels happiness, unhappiness, but doesn't necessarily grasp it. So I'm, I'm sure you've all, all um, had experiences with working from the head and not from the heart. But one way of, uh, of uh, noticing that you're, you've started to work from the head and not from the heart is, is um, noticing it in your body. Your body is a really good... Um, it doesn't really lie too much when you're working from your head and ideologies and right and wrong. Your body tends to be a little bit more tense and um, uh, contracted and sort of um, just just um, tight. While as when you're working, when um, when your mind is more um, open, then you your body tends to be a little bit more open and um, and clear and and uh, wide. It's soft, and there's a sense of of uh, acceptance. So when you work from your heart, you start to notice in your body that it is softer, that it is more wide. I again, Ajahn Suchita, one of his um, uh, three words that I remember is... Um, to soften, to widen. And to deepen, soften, widen, deepen. So when you come from these places of a soft, wide and deep mind, body, you know that generally what you're doing is probably not out of liking and disliking, but out of what is compassionate, what is kind, and what is ultimately good for you. So, goodness, I've only been talking for 15 minutes. Feels like an age. <laughs> anyway, I hope these some of these things are useful to you. Like I said, it's what I've been contemplating while being on retreat. But um, um, have I been speaking for fifteen minutes or forty-five minutes? Fifteen minutes? Forty-five minutes? Really? Wow! <laughs> OK.
Okay. Right. I guess I, I've, I've lost track of time while meditating, but uh, great. Well, uh, I'm always afraid of running out of things to say. <laughs> Yay, I didn't run out of things to say. Anyway, so so I will stop there, even though I actually have even more points, but I will save it for another day. And um, and stop there and say open for questions because I want to know well how if these are things that you deal with and how you deal with liking and disliking and um, how do you um, find ways of letting go of liking and disliking and um, uh you know, what are your triggers, you know, and um, are you, yeah, how, how do you work with this? How do you go beyond it? And just anything in general. So any questions or, or what have you found useful about what we spoke about, what I spoke about, or what um, difficulties might you have as you practice? Oh, please raise a hand if you have a question. Okay, so Pooja says, the biggest challenge has been dealing with my mother. There are some habits and actions of her that trigger me, especially about her health. How do I deal with it? Mm. The people closest to us are the ones that we feel we can manage the best, isn't it? <laughs> we feel if we, we uh, you know, tell them the right thing or tell ourselves the right thing, we'll have them under control. But... Um, well, your mother is probably 70 odd years old and probably has habits that she's accumulated not only over the 70 years, but over her many lifetimes. So may I suggest that changing your mother might not be so easy. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, you know, uh, mostly about other people is that we have to accept them. They are going to do things that are going to be good or bad for them and good or bad for us. And uh, and we we have to accept it. We say what is beneficial, we act we what we say we we do with not wanting to to fix them. That is like one of our favorite strategies, fix the people around us. But um just out of you know out of just we just we care for them and then we let them go their own way that's a difficult thing sometimes they do what is right sometimes they don't but um we accept that they have their own karma they have their own um you know own lives and um, we have little control over it. Anyway, that's that's uh, something I work with. I hope that helps. But uh, all beings are the owners of their karma, the Buddha says. We can only uh, be there for them but in the end, they have their own journey and we have to accept that. So, Until I another helps. question comes, uh, Venerable, can I ask uh, something as well? Sure. Yeah, so the four satipatthanas that you mentioned, I thought it was a very important point. 
uh, yeah. to get to know ourselves because um you kind of act or you tell and then you realize oh I shouldn't have done but if you have practiced the satipastana um I think you kind of you know um catch it before it happens or you know you you kind of when it comes to your mind but how do we kind of cultivate such practices with day-to-day -day kind of lay life mm. and uh, there was another thing I wanted to ask but then you 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 gave the answer about the instant gratification like we mm. have everything instant you kind of if you don't want a dhamma talk as you said we change the channel and go for a different thing or if you don't want a food, we get that another food. So the world mm. is kind of made into that, you know, satisfy our cravings a lot. Mm. And then um, you gave the answer. I was writing that question, but you gave the answer saying, be with that uncertainty and uh, mm. not knowing. And so that was very important. But um, mm. um, I'll be very grateful if you can say, like, with the lay lives, how can we cultivate the four satipatthanas? Um, do we have to go for retreat or do we have to kind of practice, uh, you know, daily or, you know, what is your advice? Well, quite honestly, in, in our everyday life, the mind doesn't really go that deep. So we have to accept that there will be certain things that we just don't get right. And you, you can't understand and you will just react simply because you don't have the space. The mind is cluttered with so many things and I know it's only when I go on retreat that uh, for a long period of time that the that I the satipatthana really deepens so you and go like oh that's what I was doing you know that's why I was getting upset over and over again so really sadly in the busyness of life it's very hard to have that deep understanding and um, yeah and and you you just have to make the best of it i'm sorry <laughs> yes but um, you know having the but the more you practice the more you do it the more you realize okay here i'm doing it again so 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 it's just practice over years and years and years, you get to know yourself. It's a slow process. So, um, unfortunately, yeah, it's a slow process. Okay, so um, thanks for that question. And then, uh, then Sean says, uh, Pooja, I have noticed with close family members, just listening to them, really hearing them, Making them feel understood and loved makes them far more receptive and allows you to see the best qualities. Wow. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, sometimes all we want to be is just loved. We don't want to be fixed. We just want to be loved. Thanks. Uh, oh, Sean corrects himself. Um, their best qualities. And Sean says, I've, and Pooja says, Sean, I will try that. Maybe I have been focusing on her not listening to me rather than really listening to what she wants. Thank you for this. And Sean says, hopefully it helps. She probably feels the same as you. Yeah. Thank you, both Sean and Pooja. Yeah. We are great fixers of people and ourselves. And um, actually, mostly, we just want to be heard. And Indy says, please let us know when Upeka when Upeka is delivering our next sermon. Indy is my dear old friend. I've known her for about, I don't know, since I was 23 and I'm, and I'm now 49. So that's a long, long time, 25 years. Okay. So Shell has the next talk. Right. So I think that, ah, there's one, Pooja, did you have something else to say, Pooja? Or that's just your hand up from before. 
I think that's just a hand up there before. Okay. So we'll come to the end and um, hope that's food for thought. Uh, oh, food just says, does counteracting your likes and dislikes help? Helps help. Um, yes, it does. It does. But sometimes, like I said, you start to come from your head and not from your heart. And then you become a little bit uh, tight again. I'm busy counteracting my likes and dislikes. So you got to watch out for that as well. Definitely counteract your likes and dislikes. Experiment with that. And, you know, I'm a great experimenter. Try it. Try counteracting your likes and dislikes and see what that leads to. Does it lead to, uh, like I said, a softening of the heart and opening of the heart, more patience, more uh, receptivity? So try countering it and see what happens. Okay, so um, we'll end there and uh, Manori will just um, wind up with uh, talk about Dana. I don't know if you're going to get me this evening. Um, oh, it's Shell. It's Shell. <laughs> so thank you so, so much, Venerable Kaka Terry, for leading such a peaceful meditation and your beautiful wisdom and getting up so early as well to join us. Um, it's been so inspiring, as usual, to hear from you. Another Vikuni and a close Kalyana Mitta of Anukampa. And we're so fortunate to be offered the teachings of early Buddhism. And congratulations on your 10th Vasa and receiving senior Vikuni status. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. We are very grateful that Venerable Upeka has given her time to help us with our two aims, to promote the teachings and practices of early Buddhism leading to full awakening and help us establish the first forest monastery in England where women can take up full bhikkhuni ordination. Thank you so, so much, Venerable, for all the support that you give to Anna Kampa. It's been an absolute pleasure spending time with you this year. And thank you for your commitment to your talks this summer. We are full of metta for Venerable Chanda Terry, uh, who has entered Vasa and Silence in Perth, following a lovely day celebrating her and our teacher, Ajahn Brahm's 72nd birthday. And Ajahn is very generously supporting Anu Kampa, fundraising for us in his birthday campaign. There was a wonderful auction this morning, which was very entertaining to watch and heartwarming to see all the generosity towards Anu Kampa. It was lovely as well to see Venerable Chanda speak about the project and I've been messaging with her before she entered silence today and she sends her meta to all and is so full of happiness for the community. All of these teachings are offered in the spirit of dana, generosity. If you are able to, we are asking for your dana, generosity towards Anukampa. We have seen the project flourish this year and we wish to continue the support to support the Bikuni Sangha in the UK and to start raising funds to expand from our beautiful Vihara in Oxford to an even bigger abode to be able to house more Bikunis, more aspirants and more lay supporters. Without the support of the community here this evening and the wider community, we wouldn't be where we are today, spreading the teachings of the Buddha to all. If you can, we're asking for monetary donation. Oh, uh, yeah. We are asking for monetary donations to support the expansion of Annie Camper. However small or big you are able to give, every penny is so gratefully received to support the Bikuni Sangha and get even closer to having a full forest monastery for Bikunis in the UK. Please visit the website to donate and the link is in the chat. You can offer one-off donations or more regular monthly donations that will really support the project. There'll be opportunities to offer food dana for the Vihara from December onwards and to offer your time at the Vihara from next year as well. Should you wish to offer these, please email team at anukampaproject.org and the email address is in the chat too. Please also see the Anukampa website for the weekly teachings that we are uh, being offered by the wonderful Bikunis and Ajahn Ramali, supporting Anukampa while Venerable Chanda is on retreat as well as Ajahn Brahm's teachings in November and Venerable Chanda's retreats and talks she'll be giving on her return in the UK, the US and Norway. 
Her retreat next February at Gaia House in Devon in the UK is now open for booking. And you can find the link on the Anacamp website to that. And all the other retreats should be open for booking later this year. Next Sunday will be at 7.30 p.m. British summer time again, and it will be led by Ayasoma on the topic of let's talk about sexual misconduct. So thank you all so much for your time this evening. Um, and I think in true Anna Campus style, we'll unmute everyone to say goodbye to each other. And thank you again so much, Venerable Ipeka. It's such a pleasure to see you again. So much, sir, sir. Thank you. Very nice to see everyone.